I just out of curiosity, because uh, some of you guys are, have kids, some of you guys don't need an excuse, you'll just find a uh, reason to go on a trip. But anybody do anything fun, like show of hands online, you can tap the little hand button. Did you do anything fun this week for spring break? Anybody? Wow, it was like staycation city here. What? It, it, does anybody need a break from spring break? Anybody ready for their kids to go back to school? Hmm? Yeah. I feel your pain. Man, we are uh, so glad that you're here today as we conclude our Dark Horses series today. And uh, we, we said this in the beginning. We've been saying it every week. A Dark Horse, if you don't know, is a little-known person unlikely to succeed who eventually does something extraordinary. And so that's what this series is about, is really exploring people, especially in Scripture, who have done extraordinary things who are unlikely to have actually done something like that. And we, we've been talking throughout this series about the fact that I think that God created in each one of us this longing, this desire that someday, hopefully, maybe, maybe a dark horse story could happen in our lives because I think God created all of us for greatness. He didn't design us to be successful into and of ourselves, but God designed us to be significant. He designed our lives to matter for something. And so this series is really just exploring several characters. There's many stories, but we picked several of them in the Bible that kind of kind of kind of show us what's going on in the lives of dark horses stories that bring the success in lives. We talked about the first week about overcoming inadequacy. Man, that's a big one. I shared kind of personal stuff about my inadequacies, feelings of inadequacies, and how I've struggled through that and how I just keep pushing forward and how that's one of the things you have to just address as a person who's gonna be a dark horse. Just come to grips with the fact that you are inadequate. There's just no ifs, ands, and buts about it. But you gotta understand that with God on your side, you have the adequacy through him that you need. And then we talked the next week about excuses. And I, I'm the king of excuses. I know how to, ask my wife, I know how to come up with a good excuse like nobody's business. And I'm so good at convincing myself that this is just logically the best solution when really what I'm doing is trying to get out of doing something that I don't want to do or something that's uncomfortable. But we talked in that week about the king of excuses, Moses, who God used probably more than any other person outlined in scripture besides Jesus in what he was able to accomplish for God. And then last week, we talked about rules for, for success from one of my favorite stories in the Bible, the, the story of Esther, Queen Esther. If you didn't hear that one, go back and watch that one. There's a lot of great stuff around the history and the context of what was going on there. But we examined the rules of success that Esther went by. And actually, every dark story you see, the, or dark horse story, you see these rules of success present in every one of them. There's a trend. And so if you want to go see what those rules of success are, go check them out. Today... We're going to look at the last Dark Horse story, which really isn't the story of one person. It's the story of a group of people. And to kind of to set us up for today's story, I want to bring you in your notes. And if you're online, you can, you can get your notes tab open as well. In your notes, I want to share with you some of Jesus' most famous words. It was the last thing he shared with his followers, his disciples, before he left earth. After he died on a cross, after he rose from the dead, he reappeared to them. He shared this with them. He commissioned them to go out and do something for him. For, on behalf of him. And this is called, in the Bible, it's known as the Great Commission. In your notes, read along with me. It goes like this, Matthew 28, starting in verse 18, says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. He's saying, I have the authority that I'm about to give. Therefore, with that in mind, go and make disciples of all, nation, all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The dark horse story I want to talk to you about today is the story of not just one person, but a group of people, the followers of Jesus, his disciples. A disciple really was someone who was, who was apprenticing under Jesus. They were being trained by him. He was mentoring them in the ways of God. And so that's what the disciples were. In fact, um, a Christian actually means little Christ. And so when someone says they're a Christian, they're basically saying, I'm like, I'm a little, you know, I'm a peewee Christ. I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can to follow his example. It means to be Christ-like. I say, uh, we, we choose to follow Jesus. And here's the interesting thing is you can call yourself a Christian. You can say, I believe in God. I believe what he did for me, with, but, I, but I don't have to necessarily follow him with my life to say that. And there's a lot of people who will say, I'm, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I'm a good person, 
but are they really actually living it out in their life? You see that when you, when you get close enough to the light to examine, are they actually following the teachings and the ways of Jesus? That's what Jesus' disciples were. These people were fanatical about the ways of Jesus. They spent three years with him, a lot of time with him, and he poured into them. He is the, if you want to look at the best example of leadership in the world, go to scripture, bar none, Jesus was the best leader. What he did as a single person coming to this earth and, and, and basically bestowing on these disciples of his, these followers of his, to now be commissioned to share on his behalf the message of the good news, the message that Jesus came to die on a cross for their sins, to pay the penalty for everybody's sins so they could have a relationship with him in a home in heaven. And now here we are, fast forward 2,000 years later, the, by far the most uh, widespread faith in the, in the world is Christianity. Because of what these disciples did when they carried on this mission that Jesus commissioned them, commissioned them to. I want to, if you've got your Bible, if you came with your Bible or if you've got the Bible app on your phone, you can pull it open on, online. Don't forget, you've got the Bible tab. But I want to uh, point out to you, each one of the Gospels, the first four books in the New Testament of Scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all give an account of what is called the Great Commission. They're all kind of very a little bit different in the way they word it. But Luke, who writes the third gospel, the, the gospel of Luke, he doesn't share his until the next, which is kind of like a continuation of Luke in the Acts of the Apostles. It's uh, this next book that he wrote. And right in the beginning, we're going to look at Acts chapter 1. And Jesus is like, right. it's like really right before he actually like takes off, he kind of floats away. He's like, bye, see you later. And before as he's leaving, he gives them the Great Commission. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says this. This is what he says to his disciples. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He's saying, basically, you're going to go everywhere. I want, I'm sending you out as ambassadors. You guys are going to go out. You're going to represent me, and you're going to spread the good news that I've shared with you, with every person, every people group, as far as you can go, as widespread as you can go, you're going to do this. And his disciples took this thing very seriously and very literally. In fact, I, I wrote down a list. Uh, these are what, what are not, not included in the Bible, but historical records that say this is what these guys did. Bartholomew, one of his disciples, went to India, Armenia, Ethiopia, and southern Arabia to spread the gospel. Matthew, Matthew who wrote the first gospel. Matthew went to Iran, from Iran to Ethiopia and a bunch of places in between. James, the son of Alphaeus, went to regions north of the land of Israel. Philip went to North Africa and Asia Minor. Thomas went to Syria and Iraq. Judas, son of James. Now, to clarify, this is not the Judas that betrayed Jesus. There were two Judases that were followers of Jesus. This one, Judas, the son, uh, uh, the son of James, went to northern Syria, Iraq, and Turkey. Now, here's the interesting thing. There was 12 disciples. One, Judas, betrayed Jesus, ends up going and kill himself. Of the remaining 11 who were truly followers of the way, all of them, except for one, gave their very life for their faith. They were all executed for their faith. Every last one of them, except for one, John. John, it says uh, that he was the only disciple who did not die for his faith, wrote five of the New Testament writings. He wrote the book, the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John later on in the New Testament. And then the last book in the Bible, Revelation, the Revelation of John. He has this vision that God shows him, and he writes his account of that in the Gospel of John. So five New Testament writings by this guy here. These guys are making waves. They are taking the Great Commission. In fact, my wife and I, years ago, we got to go on a, a trip. We went on a cruise of the Mediterranean, and we went to Ephesus in modern-day Turkey. And in Ephesus, this is where they believe that John settled for, for the, his latter years of his life. We have a picture. i got to show you this on the screen. This is my wife sitting there on the edge of what is now the foundation of, of is all that's left is the foundation of the church that was the very first church that John, it's called the, the St. John's Cathedral. And it was windy. You can see our hair is going crazy up there. But this was us literally sitting on the site. They say this is where John settled and spent the rest of the years of his life. It was so cool to actually be there in person. That's in Ephesus in modern-day Turkey. Then there's Peter. Peter, one of the, of the, tw the 12, the 11 that survived. Peter was a leader in the early church movement. In fact, if you go to the book of Acts where Luke accounts the early church and how they got started, he starts off by saying there was about 120 believers there gathered together. And if you remember, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. 
And at this moment, 120 of them are gathered together, and it says, I don't understand it, but they, the Holy Spirit came in like a rushing wind, and tongues of fire settled on each one of them. I, don't, I didn't even know what that is or what that looks like or anything, but that's the, the, the way that Luke describes this. And then it says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they started speaking, and I, I counted, and there's like 13 or 14 languages that they didn't know they were speaking, and their words were being understood by all the people that had gathered in Jerusalem for this religious festival from all around, and they all understood them in their own languages. And Peter, recognizing the moment, stands before them and starts sharing the gospel with them. And it says, out of these thousands that were gathered, and this is without PA system, this is without a stage, this is without modern day equipment. Peter stands before thousands of people. And it says, on that one day, 3,000 people found faith in Jesus. 3,000. We have a church of about 120 people on a weekend. Can you imagine 120 people? And then we hold a, a service, a little revival service, and 3,000 people, not 3,000 gather, 3,000 of those who gather give their life to Jesus that day. These guys were dedicated for the cause. Again, 10 out of 11 of them gave their very life for it. They were convinced. If you read the, the story of the, the early church through the book of Luke, and you get towards the, I mean, the book of Acts, rather, you get towards the end of that book, most theologians would, would estimate that from this small group of believers that by the time the book of Acts closes, like I think about a 20-year period of time, there are over 100,000 believers in Jerusalem by that time. It spread like wildfire. See, I heard someone say one time that if you want people to, if you want people to follow, set yourself on fire and people will come to watch you burn. And these guys, not literally, but they set themselves on fire with the passion of Jesus and people came out of the woodwork to hear the message of hope that they presented. And there started the early church. I think you would agree this was a dark horse story. But here's the thing. I don't want to spend time this morning talking about these disciples and what they did and all that they went through. Because here's the thing. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, guess what? You're a disciple of Jesus too. You're a little Christ. The question is, are you going to be the dark horse story like these disciples were in Scripture? What does it take to give your life for him? 100% all in. See, I've, I've heard the story before. There's a story of a, a chicken and a, ha- a, a pig that were friends, and they, the chicken suggested they start a restaurant together. And the pig was like, what do you want to call it? He's like, let's call it uh, ham and eggs. And he's like, nope, no thank you. He's like, why not? He's like, well, you're involved in it, but I'm kind of totally committed to this because you can give up an egg and keep going, but I'm going to have to sacrifice my life for the ham and the bacon here. And I think a lot of times as followers of Jesus, we live out like a chicken. Oh, I'll contribute to it. I'll show up on Sunday. I'll go to church. I'll do a little here and there and check off the box. But we get it backwards because Jesus didn't say that your life is about your work and your social surroundings and your entertainment and your family life. And by the way, tack on your faith to the weekend and, and you know, every once in a while, you know, say a prayer for the meal and that's your faith. No, it goes the other way around. He says, your faith is your life. And your work is an instrument God will use to spread the gospel. Your social life is an instrument God will use to spread the gospel. Your neighbors, your neighborhood where you live is a, is a tool God will use to spread the gospel. Your family is a tool. See, those are the things that we go to. We, the, the center of our life is our faith. Everything that we are, if we fully believe and are convinced in the teachings of this scripture right here, is wrapped up in Jesus. And we live our life for him the best that we can. Last week, we were telling the story of Esther. She has a cousin named Mordecai. He says one of the most profound statements in Scripture. We talked about it last week, but it's the title of, of this week's message. He tells Esther when she's doubting what she's been called to do. He says, Esther, who knows, perhaps God made you queen for such a time as this. And I pose for you this morning, perhaps God has placed you where he's placed you in your context with your family and your friends and your coworkers and your job, and your influence, and your resources for such a time as this. I want to talk to you this morning. If you go into Scripture and dive in deeper, Jesus, in, in his teachings, he actually, when he calls his disciples, he uses a picture, an analogy, to kind of show them what they're going to be doing as followers of Jesus. And then the author, Paul, he gives four other pictures of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to be a disciple, an apprentice of the way. 
And I want to share those with you this morning. If you want to be someone who lives out, if you say, yeah, I, I believe I'm a follower of Jesus and I want to live my life for him the best I know how, I want to give you the portrait of a dark horse story. This is what it looks like for a dark horse leader. In your notes, the picture number one, the first picture I want to give you, this is from Paul as he's talking to his mentee, Timothy, in the book of 2 Timothy. He says this, I want you to be a soldier. And in your notes, the first picture is a soldier, this idea of a soldier, not an actual sol soldier with a sword, with a shield, with you know armor. He's not saying that. He's saying, I want you to think, picture in your mind a, a soldier. And with each one of these pictures, I want to give you a word, a kind of a key idea that goes with each one of them. This one is focus. Now you'll know there's multiple ideas that can go with each one of these pictures, but I want to select one of the prominent ones and talk about that. And when it comes to this idea of a soldier, here's what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 in your notes. He says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. He says in verse 4, Soldiers don't get tied up in civilian, the affairs of a civilian life. I want you to underline that phrase. Don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. For then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. What's he saying there? He's saying, if you get distracted by the, the affairs of civilian life, you can no longer serve, committed, be dedicated. Your, your commanding officer can no longer rely on you because you're distracted. You have to remain focused. If, if you've ever watched a movie accounting a historical war and accuracy, there is so much focus that has to be on the minds of the soldiers as they're fighting the battle because their very life and the lives of their compadres and the people that they're trying to protect all relies on them being focused in that moment and, and leaning in to the discipline that they have. It says that uh, It's said that the soldiers back in Jesus' time, back in Bible times, committed to 20 years of service. 20 years and in those days, battle could be brutal. There's a, a little over 50% chance that they would survive those 20 years. But they committed their lives to that. They were very disciplined as soldiers. I watched a movie recently um, that Apple put out uh, called Greyhound. You may have seen it. Tom Hanks plays uh, the commander of the ship, and they end up almost the entire movie in battle after a battle after battle with the Germans. And their very lives depend on the, the uh, precision of all the officers and all the people and doing their roles. Everyone's got a part to play. It's, it's the most amazing thing to watch how they each have a role and they know what their role is. One of the guy's roles is literally to sit on the telephone with the guy down in the room watching the sonar and basically repeat everything that he just said in accuracy to the captain. And in the movie, one of the guys gets, gets, I think he either gets injured or gets killed, and he's replaced by a new guy, never been in this role, and they are in the heat of battle. And in that moment, this, this, this officer goes into shock because he's never been in a war situation, and he get, the, the guy says, I've spotted a sub. He starts giving the, the bearing and the, and the range of how far out there, and the guy goes, Captain, we have, a, we have a sub. And he looks at him, he says, he says, remember your training. What's the range? What's the bearing? He goes, oh, I'm sorry, sir. And he goes in and gives it to him because at that moment, he lost focus. Your very life depends on the fact that you've got to stay focused. And as a follower of Jesus, you have to stay focused on the mission because I got to tell you, it is very easy to get distracted. I'm an ADD kind of guy. I see a lot of shiny objects and squirrels all the time. And I'm always like, oh crap, I got to get back on track. It's so easy to get derailed. And Satan knows exactly what to get in front of you to derail you. And you've got to constantly stay focused on the mission at hand and make sure that you stay the course and do what God has called you to do. Here's the second picture. Paul gives this. He gives this to the Corinthians in the ancient church of Corinth. He, uh, he tells them that he wants them to, to see themselves as athletes, an athlete. And the, the main idea there, the main word I want to give you there is discipline. You see, if you're going to compete as an athlete in the highest levels of competition, you're talking about professional sports, worldwide sports, the Olympics, things of that nature, you have to be very disciplined to be able to do that kind of thing. A couple years ago, ESPN put out a, a little documentary series called The Last Dance about Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls and their, their last season and kind of the rise to where they got. And you watch the discipline in the life of Michael Jordan. I remember one time uh, they had just, I think they had lost a championship. It was the last game. They lost it. Everybody goes out and they take six months off to go play and hang out because it's been a hard season. Michael Jordan, the next day, was in the gym working on with weights again, because he's like, I've got to get better. We lost. I have to get better for so next year. We, that's the kind of discipline and, and focus that an athlete has. 
you have to be you have to be a focused athlete, focused like an athlete rather if you want to follow Jesus. I've watched just recently the Olympics concluded just over a month ago and watching the little um, vignettes where they tell stories about these athletes and, and the amount of sacrifice they put into like these figure skaters that practice four or five hours on the ice. And this isn't just like four or five hours in front of a computer screen like what we might do for a job. They're spinning and falling and like bruising and getting broken bones and all sorts of crazy stuff. And they're committed to it day in, day out, day in, day out. If you want to be a follower of Jesus who's effective, who doesn't fall off on the wayside along the journey because it will be tough, you have to be disciplined. Disciplined like an athlete. Paul says this in chapter 9, verse 24, 1 Corinthians, he says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. He says, you've got to run the race like an athlete. Run this race of life. Run your calling that God has given you. You've got to run that race with fervency and with discipline. Verse 25 in your notes, if I want you to underline, underline this phrase, all athletes are disciplined in their training. And then later on, the beginning of verse 27, he comes back, he says, I discipline my body like an athlete. You see, Paul was a genius when he's talking to these guys in, this, in the town of Corinth because they were very familiar with sports. In fact, the, this is like around the area of Athens. This is Greece area. They have the, the Olympics going on back in the ancient Olympic days. And they also have these games called the Isthmian Games around that region. The Isthmian Games happened every other year. And of course, the Olympics we know to happen every four years. And I've actually got a picture for you guys um, that I want to show you on the screen. This is the prize that they would receive if they won. On your left-hand side is the, is the wreath that was placed on their head as a crown for the Isthmian Games. And on the right-hand side is the olive branch they weaved into a, a wreath that would be placed on their head for the Olympics. And Paul says, knowing this picture in their mind, because all these guys knew how, what, the prize the athletes won, he says, they do it to win a prize that will fade away. One day that wreath will decompose, it'll be gone. But he says, we do this for an even greater cause. We do this for an eternal prize. We must discipline ourselves like an athlete. Then he goes on to talk about, not. he uses this phrase, I, I've got to use purpose with every step. I, may, I am not just shadow boxing. You know, boxing was actually a very popular sport in those days. It was brutal. They wore these lo- leather kind of glove things that covered, they weren't like the padded boxing gloves, these leather things that went up their arms, but their fingers were exposed. And it was very bloody and very brutal. And he says, you know, those guys go into training. Shadow boxing is not enough. You can't just shadow box against the air. You actually have to fight and discipline yourself to fight against competitors to be able to win the, the race. In our lives, sometimes we get caught in the game of shadow boxing. We're just going through the motions. Like, this is what it would be like, you know, if, if I really was to do something, but you know, I'm just going to be fine with this for right now. This feels good. But you have to discipline yourself like an athlete. Highly successful people don't stumble into success. It takes great discipline. If we want to have a dark horse story in our own lives, we must discipline ourselves like a highly trained athlete. This discipline is doing what needs to be done when it needs to be done, whether you feel like it or not. And let me tell you, that's easy to say and hard to live out because we are drawn by our emotions all the time to do what feels good in the moment. And yet God didn't call us to a comfortable life. He called us to a life of sacrifice, a life full of challenges. God says, I'm not interested in your comfort. I'm interested in your character. And your character is built through adversity. And as an athlete, you must discipline yourself to do what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, whether you feel like it or not. Here's the third picture. This is Jesus now. He's talking. He's actually calling his disciples at this moment. And the picture is the, the picture of a fisherman. You've maybe heard talk, Jesus talk about this. Again, Jesus being a master with his ideas and with these analogies is this idea of a fisherman was very relevant because he's around the Sea of Galilee and fishing was a, was a very big commerce at that point in time. In fact, they, they estimate that seven of his 12 disciples were fishermen. So they get this idea where he calls them and he says this in Matthew 4, 19, Jesus called out to them and said, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. Now I'm not a fisher. I've not f- fished in a long time. I, I remember fishing with my grandpa as a kid. That's probably the last time I went fishing. But I do know this about fishing, is that it takes a very, very intentional effort to do everything you do. There is a strategy involved. That's the word, by the way, and you know it's the idea. 
You have to be intentional because you have to, you have to consider what type of hook you need to use for which kind of fish you're fishing for. You have to consider what type of lure or bait you're going to use depending on what type of fish you're trying to catch. The right weight of line to make sure that it's not going to snap, but it's not too heavy because you're overkill. You have to make sure you've got the right kind of line for fishing. You've got to take into account where you're fishing. Are you fishing in a stream, a river, a lake, a pond, at the ocean? Where are you fishing at? Because it's all going to change how you, how you change your style of fishing, what you're going to fish. And then there's the location, like are you in shallow water or are you in deep water? Because it changes how you fish. Not to mention the time of day. Because you'll know, if you're an ex expert fisherman, you know there's certain times of the day where the fish are biting and other times where they're not. And you know where they're biting in certain regions of the lake that you fish and when they're not. And then, you know it's time this time of day I go over here because now the sun's shining, so they move over into the shade. Here's the thing. Most fishing, they say most fishermen never go more than a quarter mile past the paved path. They're posers, pretenders. But an expert fisherman will do whatever it takes. They will go as far as the trek takes them. If they have to wade into the water up to here, they will do it. They are going to do everything it takes to catch that fish because they are meaning serious business. And if you want to be a fisher of men, as Jesus describes his disciples in Scripture, if you want to be an apprentice and a follower of the way, you have to be very intentional about it. You can't just go out of haphazardly and expect by accident that you're going to be just kind of stumble into success. You have to do very intentional stuff, which means you've got to train because you don't learn this strategy on your own. You've got to constantly grow. That's why I talk all the time about picking up this tool right here. God's very word spoken to us where we can read this thing here and it can give us guides to understand the best strategy to use and the best way to be intentional with spreading the faith. The true apprentice of Jesus must employ intentional strategies, ju strategies just like a fisherman must employ the strategies to catch fish. And if you want to be a dark horse, you better be intentional. Here's the fourth picture. It's the picture of a farmer. Farmer, the key word I want to throw out there is diligence. See, farmers are the epitome of being diligent. Here, Paul, again, as a master, talking to his audience, agriculture was a huge thing during this time, and he knew exactly what kind of analogy to use to help them understand what he's trying to say to them. And in this moment, you've got to understand that the, the discipline it takes to start with farmers, farmers before dawn, and they go all day long like a farmer's life, it's a hard life. It, it beats your body up. I mean, I'm not talking about modern day where you're like sitting in a combine with air conditioning and the windows up with your radio going. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about physical farming. You see, they had to first, they had to plow the field to get it prepared for the crops. Then they had to plant the seed. And then they had to pour water on that seed. And then they had to pull weeds along the way that sprouted up. And then they had to prune back sometimes the, to make sure that the fruit was able to bear at maximum capacity. And when they came to the end of season with harvest, they had to pick the fruit. And then they had to, to either pack it away to store it to eat temporarily or to sell it or whatever they're going to do with this. They had a lot going on. And they were diligent about it. Here's what Paul says as he's talking to the church in ancient Galatia. He says, so let's not get tired. Oh, let me actually, before we go to that, I want to read to you guys, if, if you have your Bible, open up to Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to pick up to verse 7. And I want to read to you what Paul says leading up to what we're going to read here in our notes. He says this, chapter 6, verse 7, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. He's using that farming analogy. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. First rule of thumb in farming, every farmer knows this. You reap what you sow. You don't plant green beans and get pumpkins. It never happens. You don't plant an orange tree and get apples. You get the fruit that you plant. You reap what you sow. And what Paul's saying here is if you want to reap bad things, you're going to get bad things back. But if you reap good things, you're going to get good things back. He goes on in your notes to say this in verse 9. He says, so let's not get tired of doing what is, what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we, underline this, don't give up. Any farmer knows you don't go out and plow a field and plant the seeds and expect to wake up the next morning, come out and see full-grown plants. It takes a lot of work 
before you even see the very first sprouts come up. And then when the sprouts come up, you've got to protect those sprouts from drought and from storms and like hail and things like that could ruin the crops. And you've got to keep all the pests away and you've got to get all the weeds and pull them out so that you can have the maximum harvest. It's a lot of work. And it's really easy if you don't go in with the right mindset to give up, but you've got to have a mindset of diligence where you say, no matter what, I'm in this for the long haul. I'm staying the course. Consistency is, curse, or is key here. It's a daily commitment to your calling and, and anything worthwhile in your life is going to cost you something. There's nothing worthwhile in your life that is free, that just gets handed to you. Everything that you value in your life costs you something. And everything that, that you value the most probably costs you the most. And if you, you want to be used for God as a dark horse story, it's going to cost. It'll cost a lot, but it'll be worth it. The, the reward is equally gratifying to have that much gratification that comes. I can't imagine what it would have been like for these disciples to see the message of what Jesus had shared with them that they transferred over to these other people to see it spread like wildfire. They, were, they had joy. You know, there's a, a spot in scripture where a couple of the disciples get put in prison and they get beat because they were speaking about Jesus and what he did. And it says this weird, bizarre thing. And they get out of prison. It says they counted themselves, they, they had joy because they counted themselves of worthy of suffering for the cause. They were excited because they got beat up for Jesus. Do we have that mindset? Or are we like, I'm going to go into it, but if it starts costing something, I'm out. Are we willing to pay the price no matter what? Here's the, the final picture I want to give you. Picture number five is this, an ambassador. And the key idea I want to throw out to you in this one is character. You see, an ambassador is a representative. We have ambassadors that go to embassies in other nations, and other nations have ambassadors at embassies here in the U.S., and that ambassador, their, their function is to represent their nation on foreign soil. My wife and daughter love this show on Animal Planet called The Zoo. It's like the, the Bronx Zoo and all the behind-the-scenes stuff, and they have there what they call animal ambassadors, and the job of an animal ambassador, if they get chosen, is to be put in this room with a bunch of kids for educational purposes to help train kids and help them understand about animals. But there is a filtering system. The animal has to be you know, like skittish around people and not like run and hide, that kind of thing, and they can't be aggressive. And so they actually go out and they give it a try and they test out and they vet these animals to see if they're actually going to be a good animal ambassador because they want these animals to represent their zoo well with these kids. They're training a next generation on zoology and biology. And so they have a vetting process. And the same is similar for ambassadors that become ambassadors for our nation. There is a vetting process. You don't just get thrown into being, you're not, it's not like, like jury duty where you get like randomly selected to be an ambassador to you know, Paraguay because you got randomly seated and they, they sent you the letter and now you gotta go. To, it doesn't work that way. They want people who are trained and people who are vetted to make sure they represent well. Same is true with Jesus. I find it profound that he would actually think that we are worthy enough to be ambassadors to re represent him and his message. But it's a heavy responsibility because if we represent him bad, then people see him in a bad light. And I see it happen all the time. It's our job to represent him well. Paul says this in, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, he says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ. Underline that. We speak for Christ when we plead come back to God. I don't know why God chose us, but of all the ways that he could spread the gospel message to spread the hope of Jesus to everybody in the world who, has, who does not have that hope yet, he chose us to be his representatives. And the best way we can represent him well is to have character. So we can say in the words of Paul, as he told the people that he was leading, follow me as I follow Jesus. There's a heavy weight to those words. If I tell my kids, follow me as I follow Jesus, and they think I'm following Jesus because I say that statement, but my life does not reflect that, I will, the danger is I will lead my kids away from him instead of to him. Same is true with your coworkers, your neighbors, the person who served you at the restaurant who's having a bad day. You represent him with every single person in your life. For some people, the only Jesus they've ever witnessed and experienced is you. The question is, will you represent him well? What it takes to be able to represent him well is good character. Once again, I point to scripture. Reading God's word and practicing it in our daily lives, that, that helps us to grow and develop in character. I talked about this last week. Go back if you didn't hear last week and listen to this, but we talked about the fact we should be way less concerned about our, our, our capacity to do things 
and way more concerned about our character. Because here's the thing, all four pictures I gave to you already, this idea of a soldier, an athlete, a fisherman, a farmer, those things are going to be sabotaged if your character is not right. Because if you come, you have all, you have discipline, you have diligence, you have strategy, you have focus, you do all those things well, but your character is lacking, you will sabotage what God can do in your life in, in trying to make your life a dark horse story. I want to review with you guys again the, the, the five pictures. Picture number one is a soldier. And I want you to go through these and maybe just a mental inventory. If you want, you can write it on your paper, but think on a scale of one to five with each one of these as I talk through them. On a scale of one to five, one is like, I don't even think about this and I'm awful at it. Three is like, eh, yeah, it was a good day. And five is, that's totally me. And I want you to think about that and, and rate yourself on a scale of one to five as I go through these. Number one, focus. Are you focused as a follower of Jesus? Do you get distracted easily? Do you get derailed from God's calling on your life? Are you living it out to its fullest? Picture number two, an athlete. Are you disciplined? Are you going to do the hard work no matter what it takes so you can stay in the competition and not be disqualified, that you can stay in there and, and be the person who wins the prize, the eternal prize that God has called us to? How do you rate on a scale of one to five? Number three, a fisherman. How are you with being intentional with the way you live your life? Are you using intentional strategy that, that Scripture shows us and outlines for us for how we can live our life well? To not do it by accident, but to live it fully, fully intentional and use it to maximum effectiveness. On a scale of one to five, where do you rate? Picture number four, the picture of a farmer. Are you diligent? Do you put in the hard work? Are you someone who gives up easy? Or when a challenge comes on, you're like, all right, challenge accepted. Let's do this. Like, are you the person who's just ready? So are you digging in and pushing forward? Or you come up against the obstacle and you're like, oh, that hurt. I'm going this way then. Are you the kind of person who's going to stay the course? Stick with it through thick and thin. And then the, the, the fifth one is this, ambassador. Where is your character? Think of it this way. If you thought that the, the only way people in your life knew what Jesus was like was by watching your life, are you happy with what you see or like, hmm, I got some work to do? On a scale of one to five, how do you rate yourself? The more effective in these five areas that you are, the more that God can use your life for a dark horse story. And I want to encourage you this morning because it can be easy. You know, Sunday morning, we talk about how Sunday is a day for you guys to be built up and lifted up. But, but here's the thing. Every time you come, I'm going to share with you something that hopefully is an area you can go, oh, I see an area I can grow in and get better in. My brother, who was assistant coach to uh, Liberty University's girls basketball team back when he was in college, he said, the coach said this to the girl players. These are, these are like NCAA players. They would come on the court and they got the end of a practice and he would say this every time because he was hard on them and he'd, he'd push them and push them. He'd come back and say, girls, if I stop pushing, you can assume one of two things. Number one, I think you're a hopeless cause and it wouldn't help if I tried. Or number two, you're not perfect yet and I'm going to keep pushing until you get there. And I say the same thing to you that every week I'm hopefully sharing stuff that you go, you know, I'm, maybe I felt like a little bit of a punch in the gut, but it was a good punch because now I've got an area I can work in and get better at. Here's the thing. We all suck in different areas. I've got so much growth to do. When I look at these things, I'm like, oh, I got some work to do. But here's the thing. God is not interested in our perfection. He's interested in our progress. He's interested, are you aiming for him or are you turned away from him? Where are you headed? Are you headed towards him or away from him? So what if you're a one on three of five of these? It gives you an opportunity to have resolve to say, maybe I can be a two by next month or by the end of the year. This is an opportunity to get better. But here's the thing. I said this towards the beginning of the message. I believe that God has called Epic Life Church to change the world for such a time as this. I believe with all my heart, the world no more than now has needed change because there's so much dysfunction, corruption, division. There's so much wrong right now. We can get very depressed and discouraged on, on a daily basis when we see all that stuff going on. But having said that, I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful. In fact, I've never been hopeful than I am right now, probably in my life. Because every week when I come and talk to you guys and I see your heads nodding and you're taking notes and I talk to you at the door and you tell me, oh man, that was really good. I'm learning. Or you're like, Mike, I hate you because I really suck at that. When you're talking to me, what I see is you're saying, I hear you. I'm growing. I want to go closer to God too. I'm taking this journey. Here's the thing you've got to remember. When it comes to a dark horse story, God is not calling perfect people. He's calling screw-ups like me and you. Fully inadequate, armed with all of our excuses he's saying, will you do what I've called you to do? Will you trust me and step out into it? It'll be hard. It'll be uncomfortable. 
It'll be challenging, but if you trust me, I will use your life in a way that'll be rewarding beyond your wildest imagination. And I'm hopeful right now because I see a group of people here and a group of people that are online who are saying, yes, we hear you. Let's roll up our sleeves. Let's do this thing together. Whatever it takes, we're going to fall over so many times and go, well, that didn't work. And we're going to get back up and we're going to go again. Because God has called us for such a time as this, as followers, as apprentices of Jesus, to change the world. I believe that one day will history will write a story about Epic Life Church and this community of people that were passionate and got excited. And that became a dark horse story that no one saw coming. And I don't say that with arrogance. I say that with complete humility because I look right now and go, how in the world is that even possible? But I believe with all my heart that's what God has called us to. And I think he will use you and I think he will use me. The question is, will you accept the challenge? Will you step into all that God has called you to? I believe that we are are up to the challenge as a church for such a time as this. Would you pray with me? God, this morning as, as we learn different ways that we can be better followers of you, to be apprentices of you in a way that causes us to be more effective in living out your calling in our life, to share the gospel, to spread the good news. God, help each one of us, number one, to be humbled by the fact that you would choose us to represent you. And number two, filled with with a righteous pride that you called us that you want to use us and that we would take that step boldly and with pride we would represent you well. God, help us to identify the areas in our life right now where we could use a little bit of polishing or shoring up certain areas. Each week, God, we have this opportunity to grow and, and I know this, this week is no exception. There's areas each one of us can say, oh, I could do better at that. Challenge accepted. God, help us to have that mindset that we would do whatever it takes, no matter what it takes, we go step into the calling you've given on our lives, no matter how scary it is, how uncomfortable it is, how painful it is, how challenging it is. We know this is what you've called us to. And we know that the reward is not from doing the comfortable, easy thing. The reward comes from doing the hard thing and succeeding for you. So God, embolden each one of us this week to live out, to start right now, to begin the dark horse story you want to work through each one of us individually and corporately as a church. We say we are yours. What are you asking? The answer is yes. Use us, God, for such a time as this. We thank you, and in your name we pray. Amen.